Hi everybody and welcome again to another great session here uh, sponsored by the people of Zapotec. So in this, uh, for this test of the mention meter for the month of June, uh, for just by way of introduction again, I am Larry Goddard. I am the creator of Classy JS and Test Automation Architect at Oxford University Press. And you know, it's, it's just one of those things where we, we 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 always run through and get some of the best speakers to come and share some knowledge with 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 you guys. And you know, uh, what I like to say is that for this session, all your, if you have any questions, while the the, uh, the presenter is presenting, just drop them in the, into the chat box, and we'll pick them up. And, and then I would ask them to the respective speaker as as soon as they finish their presentation. You know, all, you know, also, if you ask questions that was not answered for any reason due to time constraint, then we we would get the presenter to respond to them via emails or DMs, as the case may be. Uh, so, you know, and I think that I, I think that is it for for what we are saying. So today we have two uh, two uh, good speakers. We have Thomas Hava, if I, I pronounce his name correctly, and and Marcel Veselka. If I'm getting it kind of wrong a bit, I think they would correct me as I as I go by. And so I think with I think with uh, Thomas, I'll say a bit about Thomas because he will be our first speaker this afternoon. Uh, he's an international speaker and, and, and an automation architect. Uh, say hi, Thomas. Hi, everyone. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, uh, there we are, Thomas. Uh, uh, I mean, Thomas, you know, welcome to, to the session. And um, I know you have a, a, a lot, a, a very nice presentation on the strategy and tactics of test automation, uh, all prepared for, for, for us. So um, without further ado, I think I'll hand the mic over to you. And you, you, get, you, you, get, you get in there. And, and like I say, what will happen is any questions, I would read them back to you later on as they pop them up into the, into the chat. Will do, okay. will do. Thank you for the kind All introduction. Right. All, yours, Thomas. All right, let's uh, switch on over to the main presentation here. All right, welcome to the Strategy and Tactics of Test Automation, also known as the Automation Fire Hose. I'm your host, Thomas Haver. So in today's session, I'm going to show you about how to effectively implement automation for your team or your organization. In order to do so, we must start at the beginning here, as in the origin story for a lot of the test automation and the common challenges that were faced at many organizations. Over the course of our session, we're going to learn about the appropriate approach you should take for automation, some of the framework and tools you should look, use to find the right tool for the job, some of the common challenges faced by people today in implementing automation, how you can schedule it in to the regular SDLC, some of the quality standards you should take, and metrics that I leave at the end as part of the supplementary information in the presentation if folks are interested in obtaining it. So more than the, the kind introduction. So my name is Thomas. I work for MNT Bank as a master software engineer. My team posts at Red Green Refactor. It's an, a blog on automation and DevOps. Before I was in IT, I was a scientist for around a decade studying molecular fluorescent spectroscopy and microscopy. I'm also an avid board gamer. My favorite board game is Diplomacy. Diplomacy right here, for those of you who can look in real closely. And I'm an evangelist for Ruby Cucumber. It's sort of my primary tool set that I, that I most enjoyed in helping teams adopt behavior-driven development. And of course, I have a lovely cartoon family here. So let's dive into our talk right now. First, with the background of an origin story. What I like to do in a lot of my talks is provide background information to reach a shared understanding. I want us to use the same terms and come to an understanding of what those mean. So when I say strategy, I mean a plan of action or policy designed to achieve a major or overall aim. When I talk about tactics, what I mean is the art or skill of employing your available means to accomplish an end. So for instance here, Star-Lord had a fantastic strategy for defeating Thanos in the Infinity War movie, but his own emotional tactics ended up costing his team and Thanos was able to snap half the universe. So even though you may have a good strategy, if tactically you cannot implement it, you end up in failure. The challenges that we faced 
with regards to test automation are not new. They've been around for as long as people were doing test automation. And regardless of how large your organization is, let's take, for instance, Microsoft. So Microsoft owned one of the most challenging applications to test and also one of the most problematic applications of all time in Internet Explorer. So whenever they needed to go through a change to Internet Explorer, whether it's a major change, a minor change, they needed to consider these primary testing variables, the IE version, the service pack that they would have, the different operating systems to work on, and they had about 32 different language binaries with which to address. So even for a company as large as Microsoft, with the resources they had available, they were not able to effectively test all combinations. So what do you do in this circumstance? Well, the approach that they took way back in 2004 was to identify the most popular or most valuable combinations according to their user base. And they bucketed in those co combinations for testing focus. This allowed them to perform what we know as risk-based testing. It also allowed them to create what we also now know as personas to test to. So, even though you may run into these challenges of there are too many potential combinations to test in, you can still effectively determine where you should devote your time and energy. And I'd say that same lesson applies today. When we're going to adopt a test automation approach, we're not gonna automate everything. It's not even feasible to do so, but we're gonna take that risk-based approach. When I've worked for multiple organizations and coming in and helping them adopt test automation, it's always had this sort of promise of it's going to save your time and lower costs while raising quality. From the leadership, I also get the added requirements that, oh, by the way, you can't affect project delivery timelines and you're not allowed to steal the capacity of our existing people, which makes it a very challenging task indeed to implement. So it's not a silver bullet, nor is it something where you sprinkle the magic fairy dust of automation and you end up having effective change. It's something that you need to commit to for the long term. It's another application in place that you are simply going to devote time to. Its purpose is to test other applications. So you should take the same degree of care that you would for any other applications. Automation is not a discrete activity. Going also back into our way back machine from Alfredi Dustin's implementing automated software testing book, you know, generally an application's lifespan follows this pattern that as it gets older, the cost and time to deliver increases. And at the same time, your test coverage and quality decreases. Shown here is a discrete activity where automation is introduced. Suddenly you have increased quality and test coverage and reduced time and cost to deliver. But automation here is not something where you introduce once and leave it be. It is a continuous activity that you need to develop alongside your application. It is something else that you need to devote your time to. So if you want to have increased quality and test coverage and reduced time and cost, it's something you need to bake into your team's life cycle. So it's a requirement for you to go to production to also have effective test automation in place. So whenever I help out a team or go into an organization and I want to support their automation, I look at what is the scope you have involved? What are the objectives you're hoping to reach? What is the best approach that we can take given our current climate? What are some of the framework and tools that will be a best fit for the organization? What sort of environments are you looking to test against and the constraints that you exist from a data perspective? How can we schedule this in to a team's existing SDLC? And lastly, and I think most importantly, what is this technical skill set of the team? I can't introduce specific approaches or framework and tools if the team's not equipped to adopt them. So let's look at approach as an example here. If we're going to adopt the correct approach for test automation, we want to have people have a consistent answer to the question, what should we automate? Some of the questions you would have for that is, is the test or task going to be repeated and how often? How much time could be saved? Are the requirements low risk, stable, and unlikely to change? Is it something that's subject to human error? Is it time consuming? Do you have a lot of downtime? And is it something that is repetitive? We want to have, independent of a given person, 
the same set of questions, and I like to use it as sort of an automation checklist to make that determination of what should we automate when you're going through a tasking session or product backlog refinement. So that way, at that point in time, when you're pulling work into the team space, you can make a determination of, yes, this is something that's going to provide value for us to automate rather than blanket say, we're going to try to automate everything. Additionally, you need to change the mindset of folks working around automation, both team members as well as those folks who are working on an organization level. Those test automation scripts you write should be treated the same as development code. That means that every new test that you write should factor in those maintenance costs just the same way as every new bit of code you write for the application under test can accrue potential tech debt, so too could automation. Some basic costs with our automation include the tooling itself, operating system upgrades, language upgrades, and of course you have to maintain some documentation around implementation and onboarding. So the cost is not just simply the time it takes to implement an automated test, it's much more than that. And it should be factored into your ROI calculations. And I think if you start to do so within your own team, you're gonna see that you shouldn't necessarily automate everything. You should be more selective in your approach. So consider those automation costs. Additionally, we all face organizational constraints. It doesn't matter whether you work for a large financial institution or a startup. We all have system constraints that are related to delivery schedule, project budget, and the technical skill set of the uh, individuals on the team. So we should in then instead take the approach to automate based upon the frequency of use or criticality of that flow, including potential legal risk. These are criteria that you should consider in determining what should we automate. So you need to look for complex manual scenarios that may be required data or environment setup, because those are things that are prone to human error. Those are also things that are laborious that people don't want to do that are best handled by automation. So those are prime targets for you to focus your efforts on. And this is where I go from that checklist to what's known as an automation scorecard. And I recommend doing this on a team by team basis, pulling in some organizational level scorecard items. What I mean by that is, you can either create a scale, say on zero to 10 for a category, or use a simple like check item that you have here, where based upon the features for your application, generate a set of criteria, whether you think it's on a critical path or frequently used, whether you have some legal constraints around validation, whether you have data and environment set up, whether it's prime for reuse, where you can use part of those scripts for additional tests. Once you set up those quality criteria in your scorecard, you can then stack rank your features within your application to determine what are gonna be the most valuable features to automate. And given that we're always constrained by time, you can work from the top down, as in focus your efforts on the most valuable features first. Taking this approach also allows you to identify technical debt in the form of flows that you should have automated but you did not for whatever reason. You can at least create those as backlog items for your team that you're supporting to show that, yes, we have these gaps here and you make it visible for all. What I further advise is you create some form of a cutoff. Not that we're committing to automate everything, but you say, hey, below this certain score level, this is something that should just be a manual validation and does not need to occur as frequently. So you devote your time to having a smaller subset of tests, but those tests are very valuable because again, we have to factor in those maintenance costs for every test that we write. So when I'm helping out teams, I say, all right, you're devoting your time to test automation, but is it good or not? Well, part of it relates to the strategy that we use and part of it relates to those tactics. So when I say good test automation, I mean, it's something that should enhance testing instead of replacing it. It should be helping testers do their jobs instead of replacing them. It should be part of your SDLC. And it should be beyond simple automated checks at the service level, say on like a UI. Those automated tests should be focused and informative. It should tell you about the current state of your application. And those tests should be trustworthy and repeatable. What I mean by that is you need to be able to generate an execution report or have dashboards that show the current state of your application. If every time you execute, you end up with 50% of your tests failing, then people will stop looking at that CI report. They'll stop looking at the dashboard because they don't trust your tests. And then the things that really fail and you should investigate are left unchecked and you end up having escape defects reaching production. 
So what this means is you should have a smaller test bed of 100 reliable tests over a 10,000 suite test that you have 50% failures. And it's a different 50% each time. So make your tests trustworthy and repeatable. In selecting framework and tooling, you have a lot of opportunities in the industry. Some of these are open source, some of these are pay. And you have the opportunity to adopt automation for whatever application type you have under test. So here's a simple and I would say anti-pattern example using Gherkin. So like, why would you end up using something like Gherkin as the top level? Well, you would use it if your intent is to collaborate amongst all members of the team and not just have it be someone who's your SDET writing tests. Because if it's just your SDET, you don't need this abstraction layer. So if you're going to use Gherkin as a sort of like top level as part of your tool set, in this example, you would have, say, Selenium underneath the covers. That's for web validation. You could use a uh, programming language in this case. It's Ruby and Cucumber, which allows you to write that top level validation in plain English. So this is just one option. But let's dive into Selenium, because this is sort of where we get to the point of when you're adopting tooling, you want to find the best tool for the job, not just blanket say, hey, here's the tooling we're going to use. Uh, and my organization right now, we use a whole bunch of tooling for web automation as long as it fits the patterns and practices that we care about. So for Selenium, why is this a good example of tooling that is ubiquitous in the industry? Well, Selenium itself has been re-implemented in a number of different programming languages. So pretty much every programming language underneath the sun that you want to work with, you have a Selenium implementation. So that means if you wanted to, you could align the test automation tech stack with the application tech stack, most especially if you are trying to get your existing development team members to adopt it. There's always this hesitancy to adopt a new tooling, especially if it's in a new programming language. If you can make sure that they have one foot safely in the zone that they are comfortable with as an existing language, then you're biasing yourself to success for adoption of a new tool and a new process being test automation. It also reduces maintenance costs because you keep your tech stack size smaller. So be selective in your choice of toolings. There's no one best tool for say mainframe automation, for desktop automation, for mobile automation, for web automation. There's a number of tools out there. It's about finding the best tool for the job to ensure that people are actually writing those automated tests and you're getting the results that you expect out of it. Additionally, you should adopt automation coding standards. So say for a given set of automated tests, you want to minimize the amount of maintenance work that you incur in writing those automated tests. So that means making the code that you have underneath the covers as tight as possible, as small as possible in terms of number of lines that you have to actually support, right? You want it to be something that's easily adoptable. So in this case, anytime you wanna work with a web application, you of course are gonna be clicking on the page a lot if you're working on UI-based automation. Well, Instead of writing a click method for every single object you're going to interact with, which would be laborious, you know, you want to implement, you know, a pattern in this case, the user clicks and then insert name of object here that will allow you to actually click on any sort of object. So you end up having five lines of code that could accept any time that you're going to click on uh, an application. I'm sorry, you can click on an element within a web page. So why would you take this approach like code Lego? I'd say, the style that you see here within the individual steps are imperative, which is, I would say, an anti-pattern because you don't want to describe the how in those discrete steps. You want to describe the why the user is interacting with the system the way they are, what the goal they have. But the point being, you can take those little imperative steps and you can take that code Lego and wrap it into declarative style such that it talks about the why the user is accomplishing this goal rather than the how. So that way you make it domain-based so everyone on the team can understand and you have the component parts underneath the covers that make it very simple to implement. In this case, this web suite has about 300 lines of total code underneath the covers to maintain. So lines of code generally is something that is an output of developer is a bad thing. But in this case, trying to keep your automation suite as small as possible to minimize the maintenance costs such that you maximize the amount of actual automated tests that you have on the top end 
something that's quite valuable. You don't want to spend your time fixing your automation suite. You want to spend your time writing and executing your automated tests. At this point, I've shown a few examples with like UI based automation, you know, functional tests, but those aren't the most valuable tests on here. So if we want to extend it further and say, all right, if we want to find issues with our application earlier in the development, we need to focus more on integration testing, where we're looking at interfaces or modules tested as a group, more focused on the service level validation. These integration tests are more robust and flaky UI for repeatable tasks. Additionally, if you want to try to align your autom application under test with your automated tests, you have frameworks in, that are available for you in just about every single language under the sun, which makes it easier for you to keep your tech stack slim. And taking this one step further in terms of where we should focus our efforts is unit testing, right? That's the fastest method of testing. It's easier to debug, it's reusable, it's got a low cost to fix. And of course, with whatever programming language is your primary for your application under test, you have a unit testing framework that's available for you. So this should be a strict requirement to have your application unit tested, to have service level integration tests that are present, and then also to have some functional tests. But you need to start with those unit tests because that's where you're gonna get the fastest feedback. When working with many teams across many years, I've seen similar challenges come up again and again. These are just a few of them that I'd like to relay upon you. One of those is the eponymous name of our presentation being the automation firehose itself. So this is where I see teams tend to follow along with, here's a shiny new tool that they have to adopt and suddenly they're gonna try to automate everything under the sun. Just because you can automate a scenario, does not mean that you should do it. You wanna adopt a risk-based approach for automation such that you end up in a state where your smaller set of tests are something that are going to be consistently executed and end up being very valuable rather than a huge test bed that is inconsistent in its execution and tough to maintain. Additionally, I've seen people encounter problems related to data failure, as in they will have an automated test that will work in a given environment. And once you promote the code to a next, another environment, it fails because the data you had only referenced one single environment. What you want to do is make sure that your automation is cross environment compatible. That means your test data generation and manipulation should be an upfront concern. So that test data access should be part of your ready state criteria to begin work for that development item, which means that it should be ready for testing as well. So you need to ensure that you have full programmatic access to test data so that way you can be cross environment compatible. Think about this purely from a value standpoint. If you write an automated test once and it only works in a given environment, sure, you get some value out of it. But if your automated test can work across multiple test environments, including potentially prod, aren't you doubling, tripling, quadrupling the value provided from your automation test? So make sure that you're cross environment compatible as an upfront concern. Additionally, I've seen teams write tests that will pass and you execute again, fail, execute again, pass, fail, pass, fail, on and off, green, red, green, 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 red, like Christmas tree lights. So these are flickering or flaky tests. What you wanna end up doing is remove them and investigate them. So automated tests that don't consistently pass are soon ignored by the entire team. The execution report that you send off to the rest of the team, the dashboards you should have should actually mean something. So that means you either fix or remove those flickering tests. You need to look at the root cause. Is the root cause due to your own coding practice? Is it due to application behavior, due to the environment, due to data? Whatever the source is of that flickering or flaky test, you need to find out. But no matter what, you cannot allow that to be included in your consistent execution because you're just incurring additional maintenance costs every time you execute and you're hurting the trustworthiness of your execution. Another common challenge that I've seen is extremely long tests. These are tests that are 300 lines long. They validate dozens of things. And when they fail, they skip the rest of the steps in there. And so you not only have a failure to investigate, but you have a number of black spots where you have no idea what's going on. Like the test is just there without any sort of additional coverage. 
So you need to follow those similar practices that you'd expect from unit tests and apply that same pattern across the board. So for one, unit tests and integration tests should take priority over those UI tests. And those UI tests should focus on validating one user behavior, no more, no less. So automate UI as needed to verify end user behavior, but focus your efforts on those unit and integration tests. Another common challenge, and this is not just for automation, this applies against all software when we talk about technical debt, is our goal is to finish the work, get to production. You know, you're automating just for the next day when it comes to testing. So you can't take that approach and expect to be long-term successful with your test suite. What you need to do is to treat your automation code with the same way you would expect development code to be treated. That is to say, you want to implement good practices like dry, don't repeat yourself, kiss, which is keep it simple, stupid, with scheduled code reviews, code analysis tools, and refactoring sessions. I will see teams where their development code has been peer reviewed by multiple people before it actually gets merged into a release branch, but that same test automation is just a single person working on it. Well, if we don't trust you know, our developers to push changes to a release without peer review, why are we trusting the test that is going to validate that application behavior as single threaded people? You know, we want to have multiple individuals involved in the review and execution of our automation. So your framework that you build should be built for long term extensibility, as in if you are walking out of the doors of your company one day, that that framework could still be in use years later because you've designed it to be extensible, to be long term valuable. So don't just automate to get to the next day, automate for the long term. And I've also seen automated tests lagging behind development, where teams will say the work is done on one sprint, but then they have testing on another sprint. How is the work actually done if you haven't validated the change that you put in place? So what you need to do is to make sure that automation feasibility is incorporated into the definition of ready. And those completed scripts are in the definition of done. Set a bare bones expectation that your automated test should execute in at least one environment before you set that story to done. And then the expectation for a given release is that that automated test successfully executes in every environment on your path to production. You need to make sure that this is in place again for the long term and that automation is running concurrently with development and work for a given story is not done until the testing is complete. So how do you actually schedule this in? If we have the expectation that development work and automation testing should be done within a single sprint, how should teams approach this problem? Well, one is collaboratively, of course. And we'll use example mapping for this. So example mapping was originally developed by Matt Wynn, he of Cucumber fame, that applies the BDD principles of discovery, formulation, and automation. In this collaborative approach, we expect members of the team to come together during backlog refinement or specification workshops, whatever you may call it when you're going through the process of identifying the work that the team should pull in to a given sprint so you start in an example mapping session with a given user story. And the focus is just a single user story. For each user story, the team is gonna identify the business rules, AKA the business logic that needs to be implemented for that story. For each rule that you identify, you're gonna have one or more examples to illustrate that rule. These are the beginnings of your test cases and any questions the assembled group in that backlog refinement or example mapping session that occurs should be written down on red question cards here. This is for you to take outside of the session to ask maybe your enterprise architecture or a third party vendor or someone else who is a SME who'd be able to give you a clear answer. So why? Why use example mapping? Well, those examples that you show end up becoming user scenarios. Those are the foundations for your tests because the team is collaborating on the work to be pulled into the team space, it creates a shared understanding of the work to be done. It also reduces rework of large or unclear stories because the team is empowered to break it apart into its component parts. 
And those rules end up becoming acceptance criteria. That business logic are viable candidates to become those integration tests, or if you've made it as small as possible, even unit tests. And why use that color-coded scheme though? You know, why should you create an example map and this could be in person or for like a lot of us who are working hybrid or remote on say a Miro board or cardboard it? Well, if you have a lot of red question cards in that single example map, that's a good indication that development work is not ready to begin. So the team can reject it because at the end of the example mapping session, you have a thumbs up or a thumbs down as a vote. So you want to empower the team to pull in the work or say, no, we don't quite know enough about this to have confidence to begin. Red question cards is a good way to identify here are the blockers for us to actually do this work. If you have too many blue business rules underneath a single user story, that is a good indication that user story is too dense and that user story should be split into two or more parts. Now, if you do this live during an example mapping session, you still continue with the session, but just focused on that single user story. The other ones you split off can wait for later. If you have too many green examples underneath a single business rule, that is a good indication that rule is too dense and you need to split that rule apart into two or more components. So that's why you have this sort of visualization and color coded. It gives you a general idea of large or unclear stories of rules that are too dense. You want to make it easier for the developers to implement and for folks doing testing to actually implement those validations. So what are some additional quality standards that we can adopt as an organization to help us out or on an individual team level? Well, one thing that I recommend that teams adopt is regression review. So this is an activity that you do every time you push a change into production. In this regression review, you have the equivalent of a test lead. Whoever just wants to step up within your team to take ownership of any net new tests that you have, as well as all the existing regression for that application. They're going to go into a meeting that's, that's also going to be tended by your production support. The production support could be developers on your team or it could be a separate group within your organization. Prod support should provide metrics on the incidents for that application for the release in a prior period. You want to see where you're having trouble with escape defects. Additionally, your business partners are going to provide metrics on application usage broken down by feature. Again, we can't test everything underneath the sun, nor can we automate everything under the sun, nor should we. We should focus our efforts on those areas that are the most highly trafficked and the ones that generate the most revenue for our company. So we want to see that with empirical evidence to make a decision on what we should actually test. And lastly, whoever is the ultimate owner, whether it's a product owner or you have an app owner, whatever you may call it within your organization, they should provide that list of upcoming projects with high level feature changes. You know, it wouldn't make much sense for you to devote a lot of time creating a great deal of test coverage around a given feature of your application if your plan is to immediately change it or to deprecate it. You need to see that roadmap for your product so you can focus your efforts on the things that are going to be most valuable. Engaging in this regression review, which should take no more than an hour, will allow you to focus on what tests should be added into your uh, regression suite, what tests should be removed or modified, and where do you have gaps in your coverage. Up to this point, I've shown you a lot of Marvel superheroes. Here's my own personal superhero from real life. His name is Martin Fowler. He says, I'm not a great programmer. I'm just a good programmer with great habits. So what lessons can we learn from Martin Fowler? Well, we want to implement code reviews, of course, the same as we would expect for any development code. We want to check to make sure that all automation scripts of the feature are scripted, that it's understandable by the team, that our automation represents the current state of our application as living documentation that the scripts don't duplicate effort already present because we want to keep the actual glue code underneath the covers as tight and small as possible. We wanna make sure that when we're implementing a test that we are cross environment compatible and that we followed all standards and practices followed by the teams on traceability back to development work, writing standards, formatting, et cetera. So expect code reviews just the same as our application under test. Additionally, you should engage in regular refactoring sessions. 
these refactoring sessions should focus on the maintainability of your application, the extensibility of your automation suite, and ensuring domain knowledge is spread throughout all members of your team. Like that automation suite should represent the current state of your application. It should be a good form of onboarding. So in refactoring sessions, you're gonna look at the performance of your automation tests, implementing non-orthogonal design to keep your test suite tight, ensuring that you don't have duplicated, duplicated effort and that you've stripped away that outdated knowledge. If it's not needed for the application going forward, it's not needed for your automated tests. But it's easy for me to say, hey, you should refactor. How do you actually make this practical? And something that's independent of say, a single person being the champion for it. I recommend hosting regular refactoring sessions, 30 minutes at most, once a week, where you identify a team lead, that person is responsible for scheduling it, delegating the work, selecting the focus area for that given refactoring session and creating any sort of bug reports. You wanna make refactoring a team activity. In that team activity, you're also gonna have an automation guide. This is someone that can be on the team who is the strongest resource in the automation space, or it can be an individual from outside the team as a part of sort of that peer review process. That technical oracle will help you overcome challenges. They're also gonna keep track of what occurs during that session, including any action items that people need to engage in after the session. They're also gonna keep track of an improvement status report. There are a number of tools that you can use for code analysis, for linting, that can show you the quality of your code. Well, if you keep track of that over time, you can show that even though your application is changing, that the number of tests in your automation suite is growing, that you're still maintaining good quality and you're improving actually because of these sessions. This is to demonstrate that value out of having a refactoring session. Lastly, in the focus area that the team lead is gonna select is it could be based upon your code metric report. It could be based upon a given feature item that someone's working on or an overall project release or your regression that you're executing, or even maybe logs that you've come from your CI report that you wanna investigate within your application. All these are viable areas with which to devote your time. And making this regularly scheduled makes it independent of a single person. And that's the goal for a lot of these mature activities. You don't wanna have it become sort of like an Old Testament profit approach where it's one person driving this. And as soon as they leave the team, leave the organization that it stops. You wanna make it independent of a single person. You want this practice to be a common team practice. So that way it occurs regardless of who's there. If someone's on vacation, they're out sick and they left the company, right? So in summary, what did we learn today with regards to test automation? Well, for one, you should focus on the fastest, most robust tests. You wanna create UI and end-to-end -end tests as needed. So focus on unit tests first over service, service over UI, and UI over end-to-end -end tests. Additionally, you want to build based on the probability of failure, the impact on business, and the complexity of those automated tests. And lastly, it's understandable. You're always gonna be restricted by budget, schedule, technical skill set. Some of these things that you can change over time by showing the value, some of which are just gonna be constant. Optimize within those system of constraints that you have. You can't generate the perfect solution, nor should you become frustrated at your inability to do so, but you can generate the best solution given your circumstance. And that's really where your focus should be. So, as I mentioned, I have additional material based upon metrics, but what I wanna do right now is to take a pause for questions that you may have related to the presentation I've just given here, as well as a little plug for my company, m and Bank, of which we have m and Tech branding specifically for the technology division. So if you're looking for a new career, we are indeed hiring. So it is a large financial institution. We have both hybrid as well as full remote models uh, available for folks if you're looking for a new job. So let me take a pause there. We'll answer some questions. And then with the remaining time before I switch over to my compatriot here for the 11 o'clock session, we can go through some of the metrics as needed. So I'll pass it back to you, Larry. Yeah, thanks. That was, that was, that was interesting. Very interesting. And, um, uh, you know, I, I like the way you presented. I love the superheroes. Yes, definitely. Love the superheroes. 
<laughs> I think it was. I think I want to borrow your, your slide deck to, to, to copy it. <laughs> well, if, if if folks you know want to check, you know, search for me on YouTube. You see, just about every presentation I do is is thematic. So uh, last month for for May the fourth, you know, for Star Wars. I had uh, several Star Wars themed presentations that I sent out there. So I try to at least make it visually entertaining if people don't exactly enjoy my content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, brilliant. I mean, uh, one of the things that strike me, I mean, if uh, uh, I have a question for you, but, uh, but one of the things that strike me is the, I like the way you you make it, um, you, you the way you looked at it in terms of um, what you should have to meet and, you know, and how. And I think that is one of the things, that is one of the main things that, I think I want you to to, go, to stress one a bit. Um, so it, the question is, you know, what do you what what and how do you choose things to automate within uh, uh, let me say within a sprint? How you know what? Um, I just want to elaborate a little more on it. So yeah. Yeah. So you know what I showed there was a, a selection of sort of the uh, the automation checklist. And so I, what I like to do to help when I'm onboarding team members, and a lot of times when I'm, I'm working with folks on, say, an individual team and I'm helping them start from literal zero, is I like to provide that checklist for them just to take with them to have it as a reference. So that way, when they're going through that refinement, tasking session, whatever you call the work intake process of your org, uh, that they're answering the same questions on, all right, for this given feature, this change, is this something that is feasible and viable for automation? And that, and providing that checklist is useful because we all have our own biases. We all have our own opinions about what like can and should be automated. What we really want to do is standardize that, not just for a team, but across the board around making those quality related decisions such that I don't care who's in that session for that given time. I'm going to get the same answer based upon our organizations or teams values. Uh, so, so that's where I look at it. It's like, is this something that's going to be extremely time consuming? Is it repetitive? Is the state of the system going to remain steady? And that's like a key point for automation is, you know, there are certain AI based tools that you can use that, you know, are going to be adaptive based upon your circumstance. But a lot of automation is like deterministic, like it's expected to have the same result time after time. And so you want to make sure that the state of your system doesn't change so that way your automated tests that you're writing are also going to be consistent. So it's like you write it once and you can leave it. Like that's the ideal is for an automated test, if you write it once and you can execute it many, 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 many times without going through maintenance, that's where you're going to get your most ROI. Yep, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a preacher of that. I fully agree with, 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 with you on that one. Write the test where it could be repeated, repeated constances consistently don't you actually having to touch it for any reason whatsoever, you know? Um, and that brings me to the whole, the, your whole definition of done, definition of ready when coming to, to testing. And I think that is one of the points that a lot of people miss is that you could have a definition of done in one sprint, and that definition of done is actually the definition of ready in the next, you know? So, you know, how do you stress that to, to, to members of your, of your team? I'd say that that's another challenge I'm sure you've encountered it like over the many years supporting is it's really difficult to get people to change their behaviors. Uh, and it's especially difficult from just testing period for people to uh, see the value in it because it's oftentimes like the first thing that is cut whenever you're coming closer to deadlines. Like we, we practice more deadline driven development than we do iterative uh, development. That yeah. timeline is getting short. What are things that we can give up and still push this production? We're like, well, we can give up on some of the validation or test automation component. So what I like to do is, is take it farther, is go into like the area when we talk about metrics to show folks exactly the value that is being provided by automation, that by us skipping automation, even for a sprint and having the, the gaps in your test coverage, that it's going to end up leading to a lot of problems and lost revenue long term. You have to show that empirically and you have to keep on showing that consistently. That's why I like to generate a lot of metrics and dashboards around the value that you're getting from automation or showing the loss that you have every time you decide to skip out on it. So you can't be perfect with automation and show that you have complete coverage. But you can, for instance, show that you have all of your business rules, as in like your application behavior, 
under some form of automation. You can end up showing the defect savings by finding automation in say a given environment and attach values to that. Like how would you do that within your organization? Are you like to go back and, and advocate for like our automation being done in one sprint means that it's a ready state criteria for us to continue doing work in the next one. Well, you have to calculate within your company how much the defects cost you where you find them. So like for a production incident, what is the average hourly rate for a developer multiplied by how long it took to fix that defect in production, multiplied by the number of people who are involved in there. That quickly adds up. And that's not even calculating the impact to the end users when you have that defect in production, which you should also add in. So you can end up showing a, a great body of work that says, by us cutting out on automation for one or two people that would have spent like eight hours doing this, we cost tens of thousands of dollars to our organization by, by cutting it short here. And, and you have to consistently gotcha. show that. Yeah, gotcha. Um, I have, a, I have, a, I have a, a question here from one of the of our listeners. Such, um, such an actually, his question is, is SB, which is specification by example, is that the way forward for shift left? You know, right specification, which is codable and single and the single source of truth for all. I say it is one path forward. It is not the way forward. And I say it, it really depends upon the team or the organization. Uh, a good example would be is like you can use specification by example, but it's intended to be a collaborative exercise amongst all members of the team. If you have, for whatever reason, team members or your organization split to like business and technology where they're not looking at it. Like what good is it to have that layer of abstraction that's, you know, written in plain English if only the person writing the automation automation test is actually seeing that. Like in this case, you just created some additional overhead. You might as well just get straight to the code. So I'd say it depends upon your organization for what's the best fit. I think it leads to the best outcomes for an organization, like making something that's transparent for all members of the team where we're all speaking the same language will help reduce that rework. But it doesn't mean that every organization is gonna end up practicing that. I would say it's just a good practice. It's not the practice though. Yeah, that, that, and, and that, is, that, that is so, I think people say that is so true. I mean, especially when coming to the, the single source of truth for all um, thing. Now we have, a, a, that's a lot, that's a next, one of those next tentacles that we, we need to, to look at because you know you we have we have people say why don't we put put it here and we'll use that as this the one the single source of truth but then you still have the whole the, you have to tell us who is going to see it who is going to interact with it you know what kind of control you have over it because if you you could you could write in it and then I could go and change things without somebody without anybody else knowing that just models the whole single source of truth thing so yeah, it, 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 I guess it's one of those things where is it is it worth is it worth it for me now, or is it worth it for me in this particular scenario, and you know to to use that. So yeah, I I'm really cool with that. Um, and and just one other thing, uh, you know, uh, you, you mentioned the whole um, when coming to refactoring, and it must be a team effort. You know, I like the I like the way you say you know refactoring guy. I, I, I like that. I, I definitely like how you said the refactoring guy to, to look at it. Um, what do you think is, should, should be one of the biggest takeaways for the for the audience when coming to refactoring, especially yeah. tech code? Yeah. So I'd say, you know, there's multiple value propositions with it. One of those is the state where you have, you know, a senior member or maybe a couple senior members of your team. And you, of course, have junior members of the team conducting refactoring as a group session allows you to impart knowledge to uplift more junior members of the team. So it's a way to provide value to the application itself, but also to uplift members of the team. Additionally, like because we are doing this on a regular basis and ensuring that we are sort of like pruning our garden, so to speak, we are making sure that the automation suite is in a good state no matter the circumstance. So that way we're confident in the results that we get. So Conducting these as a formal session rather than individual breaks down those silos. Make sure that it's something that's communal and make sure that we show value. And I think that's something you're going to see Larry, like consistently, like with the things that I've, I've talked about today, is a lot of it is about creating that those deliverables that show the value of automation. And that is because 
you all listening today, presumably you're all involved in some way in the quality aspect of your company or organization, is we have to consistently show value with empirical evidence to change minds to make sure that we're given the same degree of care that you would expect the development team members to. So showing empirical evidence is one way to do so. Be consistent advocates for quality and do so backed up by data. Yeah, thanks. That was well. That was that was very uh, well done, Thomas. And um, I want to thank you for taking the time out to come and have a chat with us, and you know, spread a little bit of the awesomeness onwards to the to the to the um to the community. Um, you know, in saying that, so thank you very much. And um, if we, you know, without further ado, would you like to? I'll give you this one. You have one minute to wrap it up and say, you know, that's that's um putting your plug for for the. For the community yeah so you know i would say there's a lot of information out there you know when you're trying to learn like what's the best tooling that you can leverage as well as what's the best approach you can take i'd say assimilate as much of that information as you can don't just go by one source uh pull in and find the best solution state that's going to work for your organization no two organizations are alike. No two teams are really alike. So be flexible in that approach and educate yourself as much as possible. This sort of webinar, Zappletech, is one of those great ways to do so, to expose yourself to how other people have done things in the industry. So keep on growing, keep on learning. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And, uh, and, uh, and at this point, again, I would say thanks to Zappletech for you know, giving us this opportunity to spread the word to everybody. And now uh, we just move on. We wouldn't even waste any time. We'll move on to our next um, our next speaker, Marcel. Uh, hi, Marcel. How are you? Hi, Larry. I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad. Not too bad at all. Um, I wouldn't. I, uh, I, I tried pronouncing your surname earlier. Sure, I got it wrong. So I wouldn't. I would it try was great. It, <laughs> it was great. Well, what I would do is. Um, yeah, what I'll do, I would, I'll just let it, let 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 us let let everyone know that um, Marcel is gonna give us a little talk on autonomous things, autonomous testing. Sorry, my bad. And you know how to introduce testing bots to boost your efficiency and speed. This will be very interesting. I think I'll be paying close attention and taking notes myself. Okay, let's see whether. Right. Yeah, without like further ado, um, Marcel, I think the, uh, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I don't know whether you could see my slides already. Hopefully, yes. Yeah, it's, I can see it. So hopefully you uh, do. So welcome. I would like to talk about something I'm patient about maybe last two years, and this is autonomous testing. And I'm researching the, the area and idea and, and topic and approach in, in that space because I, I believe this is a next era of software testing. And today I decided to talk about testing bots. So let me start first with very short story before we will go into the details. So uh, it's already a couple of years when uh, GitLab started with one survey. survey. Uh, they call it uh, DevSecOps survey for DevSecOps report. And they just find out that people following some DevOps, uh, DevOps approach, always complain about testing. And they are saying that this is the number one, number one reason for delays in delivering of the software. When I saw it first time, I felt like that's a stupid conclusion, but it was proven four times in a row. It was the, the, the people get that, that answer a couple of times in, in a row. And being in uh, software testing 19 years, it's pretty painful for me. So, and I heard a lot of other type of complaints, like some people saying that testing is too expensive or test automation is too hard or testing is boring even for some people or testing is too slow. But for me, testing is always fun. I really love that. That's my, the number one thing in uh, my professional career, I, I never experienced better activities than testing. You could uh, uh, imagine that as a 
test, coordination, planning, automation, execution, bug reporting, and so on. I really enjoyed it. So I was about sorry about that conclusion, but I believe there could be some better testing because I, I would start thinking about that, what this really means and what we, what I experienced for that couple of years I'm, I'm spending in, in testing. And I, before I will share what I believe it's happening on the market or where we are heading in that area, maybe autonomous testing is the, some maybe partial answer how we could make the testing better. But let me start with my proper introduction. So my name is Marcel Vaselka. I am based in Europe, in Czech Republic. I'm Slovak, living here in uh, Prague for a couple of years, since 2009. I don't know, it's maybe 14 years already. I am founder of one uh, software testing company. We providing uh, testing services and training for uh, our customers. We train more than 500 people a year in uh, quality engineering and software testing from some test design techniques through test uh, automation or test management, if, uh, if you wish to call it in that way. And this year I decided to start my new journey and that was uh, building a new startup focusing on uh, autonomous testing. And we are building a platform with name Vopi which is focused on autonomous testing. So let's start with that first uh, idea I would like to share with you. I have four uh, different, I would say, chapters or section I would like to talk about, and it's journey to the better testing. Uh, the idea of testing is pretty old. I don't know whether you know, but according to some sources, the testing itself was introduced as an independent activity in 1979. Test automation was introduced in, in 1985. And uh, on that time, people just find out that the manual testing and executing the system under test is heavily complicated and slow and uh, the regression testing might be uh, difficult to do uh, and keep up with uh, developers. So some th th there was introduction of test automation. And a couple of years ago, someone says that there is an even better way of doing testing, especially the one uh, which is repetitive. Usually these are the regression tests and uh, introduce autonomous testing. I'll be talking more uh, about autonomous testing soon and explain what does it mean and what does it mean for me. But let's start or let's move on to the to the to the same topic with from from different uh, point of view and i would like to share some examples that you could maybe spot on that journey that there are many vendors or open source solutions supporting the idea and we start maybe uh, with paper later use uh, excel moving to the some test management tools doing the manual testing then introduce a lot of tools and the new tools are popping up. And for me, this is not important which tool we are using. I am interested in that topic, in that area, how we could develop or how we could improve our testing. And some ideas already matured. And I believe the test automation is already matured idea or approach. And we need to just master it or deliver it into our uh, into our organizations. And I believe it's already, I would say, solved problem. So you could find on the market a lot of, lot of experts, a lot of exper uh, experienced guy, guys who could help you to do so. For autonomous testing is something new. We are still searching how we could uh, deliver that, how we could implement that. I'll be talking about that on the next slides. So what's the autonomous testing? And that's not my idea. That's uh, something uh, all market is looking at. And I decided that maybe I'll try to make it a bit more practical today. And I'll start with definitions, which are out there on the market. But I'll bring my own examples or some samples, how it could look, look so. So according to Catalon, they, uh, they, they work with uh, Deloitte and, and Signity. 
uh, they define autonomous testing as a six level of testing. The zero, uh, the level uh, zero is manual testing. And as you keep adding more and more automation, you could end up uh, in uh, autonomous testing where computers have a uh, full control on the testing process. This is kind of science fiction because there is no such a tool, no such an approach, but let's see how far it could go and how, what we could do for, uh, for that. So let me try to make it a bit more uh, simple and make it in my way. So if we are talking about manual testing, that would be my way of doing manual testing. If we are talking about automatic testing or automation, test automation, I could imagine it as, as, as some automatic machine. And then we have some autonomous testing. So, and now talking in, in uh, testing process or test activities, uh, we often see test automation in a way to automate test execution. Of course, there are, there are some, uh, some uh, specific examples or cases where we automate test data preparation or test, uh, test case generation, but we are still heavily focused on test execution, which is pretty big benefit for our testing practice. But what about preparation? Why we are still writing the tests manually and we, we, we call it test automation, why we don't generate it, why we need to manually process all this maintenance or uh, result uh, handling. So this could be also maybe automated. And once we could cover that other activities by some automation algorithms, it could become more autonomous. For me, autonomy is not like some end stage, it's more goal to, to, to come closer uh, to. And uh, for me, autonomous testing is, I would say, extreme automation. So we are trying to automate even more and trying to challenge this status quo that we could automate only execution or regression testing, or we need to still write the test cases in some programming language. Of course, there are some record and play, low code, no code tools. These are the ideas which could bring us closer to the autonomous testing. But then the question is about the maintenance. Uh, I was trying to also build or rebuild some other pictures from uh, other companies. You could find a couple, uh, couple of definitions of autonomous testing by, I saw one schema uh, from AppliTools. And I also saw some other schema by, uh, I think that it was published on Forbes. And I don't remember which company published it there. But there are a couple of uh, definitions how test, testing autonomous le levels could look like. And in a green, I just decide to be brave and estimate when this level could be implemented or could be ready and we could use that fully autonomous testing. The, uh, this could look pretty weird or, or crazy. And I believe this is where we are heading. And the question is how quickly we could get there. And let me support the idea. And then we could go into more uh, details about the, the bots I, I'm planning to talk about mo most of the time today. But this is report from Gartner. It's pretty old, it's already three years. And they predict, predict that autonomous testing is one of the uh, idea on hype cycle for agile and DevOps. And autonomous testing was somewhere here and they predict that it will reach this, uh, they call it plateau of productivity in five to uh, 10 years. Uh, if you don't know hype, hype uh, cycle, it's some prediction, what are the ideas coming into our industry and could disrupt, disrupt the, the, the market or bring some new ideas into the, the market. The important thing is that there is some, uh, I could call it volley of that. So if you cannot pass that, 
it could easily die in this uh, area. But what happened uh, just last year, uh, they, uh, they announced another hype cycle for Agile and DevOps. And this idea was moved into, I would say, next stage. Or, yeah, I would say next stage. And the prediction was that it's coming and it'll be here in five to uh, in two to five years. It might happen that it'll die on that way, but if the idea is viable, it's coming and it'll be very soon here. And I saw some other uh, prediction that it could eat up very quickly one third of our uh, testing market, which means that one third of the, the budgets companies spending on testing will be uh, shifted to autonomous testing. So this is pretty uh, interesting idea to follow and see whether this could or what uh, what could happen uh, on the market. And while I was uh, researching uh, the, the topic and searching for how we could implement it already now, I find out that it's not so easy because there is not too many too many options for that. I'll be maybe share uh, these options with you soon in my next slides. But before that, I had one question, how we could get there, how we could implement autonomous testing. And after a couple of iterations, after a couple of uh, reading or researching the, the, the reports and articles and blogs and, and interviews, I find out that there are basically two options you could choose from. I believe this will become one, but uh, nowadays you could just keep improving your existing test automation to make it more autonomous. I will just very quickly share these uh, ideas about how we could improve our automation at the end of the presentation. But before that, I would like to focus today on, uh, uh, on idea of introducing testing bots which is something with, which I feel like it's pretty uh, new approach. Uh, someone could be skeptical and could say it's already here a couple of years, maybe two or three years it's, it's here, but this is popping up more and more and it's, it's becoming something which is uh, now heavily deployed. And let me again prove that statement by some stats or some data. I don't know whether you know company Forrester, that's another company similar to Gartner. They do a lot, a lot of research and analysis and reporting. And they were posting some nice blog about Turing bots, which are basically bots, which are, it's AI powered software helping us across entire development life cycle. And the easiest, or the simplest examples you could spot on the market are the bots you meet on GitHub uh, projects. There are a lot of bots uh, checking your dependencies and updating uh, your Node.js projects, or there are some bots checking your security uh, compliance or some other bots to uh, reporting to the issues you you uh, uh, post so it, it replies to, to your uh, bugs very quickly and so on. And this same idea is coming also to the testing. And uh, I just decide to very simply uh, define that as well. So if we are talking about Turing, uh, Turing bots for entire uh, development lifecycle, I would like to define some software testing bots, which are basically the same softwares, uh, AI powered software, which helps us to test or which help us uh, during the SDLC or software development lifecycle uh, cover the test activities. And that's again, if you could if you search for some data, you would find out that uh, again from some other report, 65% uh, uh, of the teams are using already AI and machine learning in testing. 
that a bit strange statement, but there was some uh, addition to that, or they will be using it in three years. This is the result from uh, some uh, report by GitLab. I think it's the same report I was complaining about with these uh, delays. And uh, these are the top three workflows, as they call it, or activities they expect that they will be using AI and machine learning in testing. And I would like to focus on that second one because what they uh, claimed is that 53% of uh, these companies are planning to use testing bots. So this is something people or organization are look, looking at already, or already start experimenting with. And we do the same. So let me first start with the idea how we could build that bot. Because one of the challenge on the market is that there is not too many options you could choose from. And if you know some, uh, it would be great if you could post in, in a comment uh, what are your experience with the bots in testing. But I find out that there are just a couple and uh, the maturity of that bots are not very high, I would say. So I think that if you want to start with that now, you need to build your own bot or uh, heavily customize already existing bots because it's it's not there yet, but it's coming. And, and I believe this is a idea with a big potential. So how to build a bot? Uh, you need to basically cover two features. One is the interaction with the application. And then you need to find out how you could autonom or automatically validate the results. Or in other words, how you could implement automatic assertions. So you don't define each and every assertion. You just build something uh, which is generic or automat automatically adjusted uh, to your application. If I would go into more detail, because this is very high level, uh, that's something what you need to think about is the application you are testing. So if you are testing UI, probably your bot need to interact with application in different way than if you are testing some APIs or some files or databases or networks. I'll be uh, sharing with you one example uh, where we are building bot for web uh, app testing. So in that case, you need to be able to basically understand the, the, the UI uh, to be able to interact with, to click on some elements, maybe to fill them uh, with some values and so on. For APIs, probably you need to be able to do some HTTP requests, understand the bot in general need to be able, able to understand uh, what are the post methods and maybe to be able to read some documentation, which is pretty standardized and so on. And there are such a tools where you could generate the test already now. And that's the first piece of, of, of your bot because you need to have a second one, which is for the validation. And for the validation, you need to have something to validate some specific, I don't know how to uh, call it, features or uh, parameters. And for instance, when you test, uh, I don't know, performance, you probably need to measure how quickly you are getting the response, maybe size of the response. When you test the security, there might be some other uh, requirements. And the question is, or the question, yeah, the question and requirement to build that validation uh, is that this need to be automatically generated as well. So once you are able to generate interaction with the app and validation with the app, which is dynamic based on the app, the bot uh, will be provided with, then you have the bot. And let me move on because I have also some examples how it could work. And the example is based on something we are building. So I'll, I would like to reuse or uh, benefit from the, the experience from there and, and share the principles, how we are thinking about that. And also a very short couple of second uh, demo, how it could work. So imagine that you have this web app and you would like to test it. It's simple e-commerce application, or maybe call it, uh, it's too, uh, 
generous to call to 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 call it uh, e-commerce. It's basically simple e-shop for one uh, single drone, and you might have a couple of test cases. So maybe clicking on the link, I would like to check that the application stays on the home page. Then I could have some other where I click on home uh, menu item and I'm getting the same screen again. Then I could have something for the for the gallery, something for the uh, for the contact page, and then something for the login page. Or maybe I could even like to see what's the how the uh, checkout page looks. So doing this, I could maybe state that I have six very simple test cases, checking whether the page is still OK. And once I have it, I could navigate through the application and uh, build some map. And through that map, I could navigate and generate the test cases. So once I have the test cases and the way how I could navigate through the, the application, I could choose which uh, test I would like to uh, execute. And this is not only this example is just for the clicks, but the same is valid for the fill uh, or swipe or scroll. It depends whether you are on the mobile or, or web uh, or clicking on the checkbox and so on. So the map will probably become a bit bigger, but this is the map you could use to uh, learn how your application works and then generate the most valuable test cases. Of course, this is also one of the feature of the bot and a big question how to generate the valuable test cases. There are a couple of uh, approaches. I don't wanna uh, now uh, go too much in, in detail. If you would be interested, we could have some follow-up session and discuss that uh, ideas and details. But once I have this interaction uh, done, uh, then I need to cope with some validation or, or assertion. And for that, I decided to uh, take one simple example and it's visual validation. And for the visual validation, it might be even more interesting for the test automation engineers who are uh, extremely good in level of automation because sometimes for simple changes, we just skip manual testing and we do only uh, automation, automated checks. And if all goes OK, then we deploy into production. But in some cases, this is not very secure or a uh, good idea. Because imagine that you have this type of checkout page and you have some Selenium or Cypress or Playwright test, which are navigating through the application using regular, I don't know, XPaths or, or CSS classes or IDs to interact with that. This works perfectly. You could get all that uh, interaction and you could also get all that assertions to be evaluated as, a, as okay or passed. But imagine that the application might change slightly and our Selenium or Cypress or Playwright script could execute the same scenario with green light at the end, but probably you don't want to release this into production. So one advantage of this approach is that you could introduce some additional values for the automation itself. But other is that this is the simplest way we could discuss the stability or how to cope with some stability issues, but simplest way how you could check your screens, whether it's OK or not. So if you have the map, and you collect the screenshots across the map, you might be able to validate whether the application works correctly. And of course, if you extend this approach to make this visual validation even more dynamic, so you collect instead of one screenshot, couple of, because maybe you test on different uh, devices, maybe the shopping cart might be dynamic, so you don't have one expected result, but more, then this is a pretty useful and powerful approach. And you could continue uh, or you could start uh, running your, your uh, bot. 
I also decided to bring one more example why the visual uh, validation might be useful. And it's especially for some uh, specific cases like uh, validating screens. Uh, imagine that you, this is your registration form and you need to validate all these uh, mandatory fields, which should be all red with these cross, red crosses. And when you do it in typical automation way, you need to basically just click on submit registration and then check whether all these fields are uh, displayed as a mandatory fields. But if you introduce the visual validation, this one could become much shorter. And instead of 16 lines of code, you just need to write four. And uh, then there is some saving in test automation itself. I cannot help myself. I know that this is not fitting into the flow of bots, but the visual validation might be useful also for some generic or traditional test automation in some cases. I'm not saying it's perfect and, and uh, bulletproof uh, approach for all the cases, but in some cases, this might be pretty useful to, to follow such an approach. So once you have the once you have the validation and execution covered, then you could get some uh, autonomous bot to execute your tests. And let me now share the idea how we are thinking about that uh, validation and, and interaction. So we have simple uh, application where you share your URL to the application you want to test. Then you start training your bot and you are getting then some simple dashboard where you could easily run your test cases. And uh, sometimes I'm saying that we are turning test automation into uh, experience of exploring some pictures uh, or gallery of pictures. So instead of having a huge team of test automation engineers, uh, sometimes not easy to hire and sometimes not easy to pay well, you could uh, bring this uh, to your team and your test automation engineers might focus more on more, more complex scenarios or just maintaining that learning process and uh, managing the entire setup of the platform. So this is how we are uh, thinking about the idea of uh, deploying bots. And then if I, I thought that it would be nice to share some live uh, demo. So I wasn't so brave. So instead of that, I just record a very short video to share with you how it could work. So this is our platform. We call it uh, test, uh, uh, sorry, Wopi Commander. And you just click on button red, uh, run test and the bot executes the tests. Uh, of course, the bot need to be configured and trained before, which is, uh, I would say, still, to be honest, uh, manual work. But after that, the test execution is so simple, just clicking on a button. Of course, when we are developing this and when we are introducing this, people are skeptical. So we also provide some uh, future, uh, sorry, some feature for uh, digging into more details. So you could go into the details of the last or any test execution and uh, see that results in traditional way. So you have a list of tests which were generated. Uh, it generates also some locators. And then uh, it has on the left side the baseline uh, screenshots and it compares with the uh, actual screenshot. And if something changed, then uh, you could uh, see it here. So of course, uh, there is still some manual work. It's not fully autonomous. As I said, the autonomy is the journey to, to easier automation. But we believe that this is the way how we could bring more, uh, more or easier way to uh, business teams or, or uh, manual testing teams. Uh, and instead of uh, learning some programming stuff, they could they could use this uh, platform. 
So that's that's the example, and that was about the bots. I believe this is the idea of, uh, people now or a lot of companies working on, including the the others. Uh, I could give you some more ideas uh, in the next slides. So, as I said, there are two options. One is to building a bot, to 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 have some tool, autonomously test the application, and it's still a bit primitive, but it's getting better and better. For instance, our bot could log in into application if you share the, the credentials. But there are still some challenges we now uh, exploring or researching how to how to cope with. And then another one. If you are not willing to use the bot because you are skeptical or you feel like this is not Maybe this is a good idea, but it's not ready yet for us. Then I thought it would be interesting for you to bring some more ideas about better automation, I would say. Because a lot of people, as I, as I said, are focused on test execution, but I believe there are plenty of other uh, topics we could cope with. And these are my eight ideas and a couple of examples of different tools you could experiment with or, let's say, play with to find out how the how this idea could work for you or whether it's something you would like to implement. And these are my eight. So first one is predictive test selection. We often selecting test cases manually. We are using a lot of text, prioritizing and so on. But what if that prioritize, what if this prioritization is too static? Sometimes you adjust some feature and you would like to test that feature and the uh, areas around more heavily than something else. So that priorities do not need to work or if maybe you could have the tax. So this predictive selections uh, is based on some unstructured data like, or uh, yeah, some unstructured data like text or commit message or the, the changes in your code. And based on that, these uh, algorithms order your test cases based on probability of failure. And uh, you could easily get the top 10 uh, test which will uh, fail because of the change. So instead of running all the entire test suite, you're just executing them uh, as a subset. So you speed it up or you you executing them in order uh, with the highest probability first. So you could report the bugs sooner and developers could fix it, uh, or they they could have uh, they could get more time to fix it. The second one is uh, generating some test cases. There are a couple of ideas. Uh, most of them, or in this case, I think all of them, are uh, AI based. There are also some other tools, like uh, I know at least about one for API testing, where you could based on some. Uh, definition uh, generate uh, the test cases. In this case, I brought here uh, three examples. One is maybe you all know GitHub Copilot. That's my most favorite one. Then, uh, and, I, and I was using it a lot for a project when we were writing uh, Gherkin uh, code and then implementing it in, in Playwright. And it works pretty well. But there are also some other uh, like uh, autonomic by nowadays by source labs, or of course, ev everybody knows ChatGPT. The third idea I believe could help our test automation to become more autonomous. Even some people are really skeptical about it, or I would say even hate the idea, uh, is self healing. And in that area, uh, there is a lot, not too many tools, but, uh, and it's mostly around Selenium, uh, but there is at least Hel Helenium. And uh, I know that Parasoft uh, building some tool called Selenic. Uh, and I believe, and I didn't see too many tools yet, but the same self-healing idea could work also for a test data generation. I know that we have some fakers to do so, but I believe in a future we have so much data we could learn from that self-healing could work for test data generation as well. 
And the uh, fourth one, so we are in the middle of my list, are the autonomous navigation or interaction. These are the bots I was talking about, so I will not spend too much time on it. But apart from our solution, which is uh, VOPIO, there are some others as well. So if you would like to explore the idea, I would uh, suggest you to uh, maybe subscribe for some trials or demos and find out more from these guys how it works and whether this would be a valuable approach for you. Of course, uh, we could introduce the, I would say, visual object, object uh, recognition. Uh, some people claim that instead of using locators, which might be horrible to uh, write in stable way, and they are always unstable. So there are some believers that using uh, UI object recognition, or, sorry, image object recognition would be much better idea. And there are some tools. Uh, I just state to uh, ask UI or the, the tools AI. Uh, I was talking about visual uh, validation a lot. So if you are interested in that uh, topic, I would suggest to explore the Percy Apply tools uh, over it, or we are also uh, providing this, uh, we call it assistant uh, as a part of our platform. This is kind of co-pilot for your existing test automation frameworks. So you could introduce easily visual validation into your test automation. Uh, then I find that uh, one idea, and I didn't find more than uh, some uh, YouTube videos by Paul Grossman about dynamic or magic uh, page object model, where these uh, page object models are not written, but are rather generated. And I think he has also a nice demo. It's in Java and Selenium, but I believe the idea could be taken to any framework and any, I would say, average or uh, a bit exper more experienced test automation engineer could take that and rewrite it into their own uh, framework. And the last one, I believe this is maybe uh, how to say that uh, hidden idea or I idea people don't uh, uh, benefit from and that's uh, taking data from test automation and turning it into some valuable data, some smarter reporting. And I know that there are a couple of tools already popping up and uh, maybe that the first one I, I, I spot or noticed was report portal, but nowadays there are some other. And I believe we could uh, learn a lot from history and data uh, we collect during the test automation. And I find out that there are plenty of organizations with pretty decent test automation, but not uh, benefiting from the data they, they could. Uh, so this, this is my eighth idea, how we could improve our test automation to become more autonomous. So let me summarize. Hopefully, I have still enough time. <laughs> Uh, I was trying to talk about some journey, the journey to the better testing. I believe that we keep adding more ideas and more, more approaches. So from manual testing, we went to auto test automation. And nowadays, people start talking about the autonomous testing. Even it's uh, in pretty early stage, I believe this is something which could be very valuable if we find a way how to implement it. It takes 20 years for test automation to come into the stage where we are now. So let's see how long does it take for autonomous testing idea to become mature enough. So we will be, or it will be so obvious that we will not discuss whether this is a good approach or not. I was trying to explain what it's out, what's the autonomous testing for me. And it's more journey to getting into better test automation and automate more than some completely different approach or something new. It's just better test automation. I was trying to uh, prove that uh, testing bots might be one of the options to get there. Even uh, there are some other options. And I was talking also about the other options. And these are the ideas 
how we could improve what we already uh, invest into or what we already have in our uh, teams. So these were my four topics or four ideas. I would I, I, I was excited to, to talk about and share with you. Hopefully it was useful for you and you found at least one idea on the list you could implement tomorrow or very soon in your teams or at least discuss it. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you very much for, for the organizers and also to the all, all attendees that you stay until here. And I'm happy to discuss or answer the questions or whatever will come now. <laughs> If there is still someone, someone here, jump in and jump in. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah of course. Yes, Paul. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, um, that was very interesting. And um, and in saying that, I I have a I have questions. There are questions. Uh, and one initial, the first one. I'll just ask the first one straight off the bat. When you say bot, does uh, does it mean automated script? That, that's the first question. That's just true and all that. Uh, for me, bot is generic automation script, but generic because what's typical traditional test automation, it's sometimes I call it single purpose test automation because you do that for very specific reason. Like I would like to create a customer or I would like to block the payment card, but it's single purpose and uh, that bot is generic approach. So instead of writing this specific specific uh, flow, you are trying to build a bot in a way that it could spot the, the elements. In my case, in my example, it's elements, but in general, in general, it's to spot the, how it could interact, then it interacts and evaluates after the uh, interaction. So it asserts the, 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 the thing. And of course, we could discuss whether it's part of the bot. We are also discussing it uh, within our team, whether it should get only the instructions from something we call brain, some backend system to processing all the data. So it would be just uh, the, the tiny tool. We be able to interact with application and just read the instruction and send back the data. So data will be processed in some backend system. And in some cases, some features might be built within the bot. And it's uh, there is a lot of discussion internally what's better in terms of performance and ability to processing the data and, and generating the next step or next instruction to the bot. In some cases, it's much better and more stable to keep it with the bot. And in some cases, it's better to move the logic into, into some backend system where you collect all the historical data and you could process and uh, prepare the next step instructions for the bot. I mean, it, it, building bots is, is, is really nice. And have, and like you say, yeah, there are a lot of a lot of things out there, touch ETP and all this kind of thing. Well, what, what what do you see as a as a time frame to say? When I'm using the word time frame here lightly, as a time frame to say, I develop, I created a bot to look at my application to help out. How long do you think it it would actually take to for that bot to give me back some valuable uh, responses. I okay. We start. Uh, I, uh, maybe I could share my uh, my journey or uh, our journey uh, in the organization. We start with small experiments, because mm. my first idea was okay. Let's let's learn something from the market, and let's just use what's out there. And I find out that there are not too many options. So we start with the experiments, and it takes maybe three months, and do to get the understanding that if we want to start with something, we need to build it ourselves. And it, then it takes maybe six more months to build our first version. And it was still heavily built on top of open source solutions. And then we were, were challenged by an, another problem because we find out that this open source is not supporting us enough to go further. So then we keep removing start keep removing the, the the open source solutions and replacing it with our components okay and i think we are still at the beginning of the journey because if you are starting from i would say on greenfield or from from the scratch 
it takes some time and this is still uh, the, the 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 era where there is not too many options to copy f- from someone because all the companies are innovating in that area and uh, you cannot easily reuse something like nowadays if you want to automate web app there are so many options but to, to introduce bots in your organization it's not easy and in all, in many cases you need to also understand your context because that's the shortcut if you would wait for the generic bot which could test any web app it might take longer then you would say okay this is my use case i'm testing i don't know uh crm solution and for that particular uh application it's it might be easier to to make it not so generic and shortcut mm. to, to 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 have at least something. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's true. I mean, I mean, when we talking about billing billing bots and thing, you know, you have to have it, it have to be running. So it, I think it comes back to: Do we actually need to bill a bot? Uh, yeah, yeah, we love because do we actually need to bill a bot or stay testing, doing automation testing as opposed to going all the way to autonomous testing because mm-hmm. some wouldn't last that long to, 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 for you to build a bot and then use it. Or you might build a bot and it's generic and then you can't really use it on any other on another project because you'll have to learn because the mm-hmm. whole application might be so different. So how do you weigh up that, um, that, that differences? I, I think this is a great question I had at the beginning when we start because I, I didn't know whether I should improve what's out there, like improving the automation frameworks or build that pot. And I think we end up in some hybrid approach. So bot will become just another approach in our test automation. So you just deploy the bot, it collects some data, maybe then you write some other test automation, uh, which uh, bot cannot do, or it's not uh, able to do some complex scenarios. So it will be some combination. I don't believe that it will completely replace uh, test the automation very soon, but uh, that's the the way how I believe will develop uh, in uh, future. And another thing is that it's completely different situation when you have. A, and I, I saw a lot of our customers; they have a bunch of manual testers, and they are struggling to make the step into test the automation. So for them, having a bot might be a huge improvement. But if you have already skilled team. Uh, full of test automation engineers or SDs or whatever we'll call them, it's a completely different story. Probably you don't want to... You invest a lot. People master that and it works perfectly. So for that, the added value introducing bot might not be so huge or so 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 big. Yeah, I got so, that. And I mean, the, the, the whole thing is, I mean, in terms of what a bot is, and I'm looking at uh, some of the comments on uh, Lissandra, uh, she's saying for her understanding of a bot is just is it is it another just another higher level of automation? And I kind of I mean I'm looking at it and I kind of tend to agree with her. You know I, I tend to agree with 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 with, with that comment um, because like like you're saying is about the uh, it's just about getting to do that specific thing that you could just press a button as we just say press a button it will go off and do that. And that brings me to the to my next question in turn um, where. And I think it's more to do with your um, your application. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things is, could somebody, what's the technical level or technical experience necessary to would be required to use your application? Mm-hmm. Uh, I will tell you something. Our current stage is that this is for test automation engineers. But our vision is that it will become something like, sometimes I call it like the app, similar to Spotify or weather forecast. So you just press the button and play your favorite playlist. Okay, and gotcha. it might be this playlist is for this release. And the other comparison with that forecast is that maybe in three days, we could spot some bugs, maybe some performance challenges or something, because we will have so many data that we could predict what will happen. You could see that it's coming. And this is very like abstract and visionary. I don't believe 
it will happen happen very soon but this is where we are heading this is what we are dreaming about what, what we are what we would like to build in in the in the product that where we see that if i have unlimited time that's where i would go yeah i mean i, 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 I mean i mean that's that's really that's really that that's really good in in the sense and you know how you know like I was, I was i was looking at what you're saying and you know look at, at all the whole long list of, of doing things especially the one that um paul grossman have where he you know this magic uh thing that he have yeah. and i mean it's good i've seen it before uh, and things like that so what advice would you give to let's like, say a new player in the in the group that hear about the technology and actually want to, to utilize it uh, yeah what do you mean by that like... oh okay so i have a, a, a application to test i have an application to test and i you know i'm thrown in the deep end i want to get it done that I've done my back to get things done and i need to and i need to to, to um to, to do it you know how do i you know where do i go or do I have a choice to say, oh, I would use a bot instead of actually writing all the code? That's that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, but that would be. I think that would be pretty nice idea. I know that there is no such a tool that you just provide a URL and it's a test for you. But this is what we are trying uh, work on. Or not trying, we we are working on on that, and and uh, we the, the vision or that what we are fully honest how we could make it and we are coming closer and closer i cannot predict how long does it take but you see now nowadays you see the chat gpt acceleration and this is just start so with these type of algorithms we could do so many cool stuff and for instance uh, in our we have some prototypes like we generate the steps in test case and I, I was just prototyping that we take that steps and via REST API, I ask ChatGPT if these are the steps, what could be the name of the test? And it okay. gives me the name or, or another exper experiment. These are the locators of the fields for the form. What data I can use or what are the uh, data types? So you have, I, I call it embedded AI, where okay, you yeah. could easily build a bot, which is able to chat with some other tool to give you the, 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 the answers. Or uh, maybe you could say, this is the CRM system. So maybe you could ask some uh, backend system, OK, what are the top 10 scenarios for testing uh, CRM? And you would get that list. And if you have the list, then maybe you could keep going further and further and both do not need to be now it's pretty scripted all the maps are generated we are learning how that work but there are plenty of other ways how you could how you could build it and then it, it's very I, I wouldn't say very simple but it could be very powerful if you introduce all these features using by bot these all ideas i was sharing it could be used by bot and it could be embedded there so you don't need to even understand it's there. You would just get the report. This 100 test cases executed. It was, uh, this test cases was selected and designed automatically, and you will get just report with the results. Yeah, you I might mean, see, don't like it, and next time you will get even better report if you give the feedback to the to the platform. I mean, and 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 and, and, and it's, all, it's also so true, you know, um, because like I say. Like I have the I have Classy JS and it's a complete it's a complete um, test automation framework. You know, it does a lot of bits and pieces in it, uh, in its in its own straight out of the box. And one of the things I was experimenting with is using Chat GTP in there to say, all right, here is my here is my feature, here is my feature. Write me, give me a few scenarios. And what I realize, and like you say in your in in, in your demos and your researches is that it gives you a lot of generic stuff that it still needs some manual intervention. And because unless, unless it does it, it, it does it have that actual application that they're going to test, then it just comes generic that you 
you know, you would just use and re, um, refactor to suit your particular case. You know, come like, uh, you, you, you ask a question, you have something to do, you go online and say, how do I do X? And they give you a lot of different ways you can do it. And you grab, oh, that will work. And you yeah. refork factor to suit yourself. So that's, that's really good, you know. And, and we know, like you say, we know autonomous testing is going to be, it's a long way out. You know, yeah. we know it's a long way out. But the idea that we could create a little bot or, or we could use one of the AI bits out there to do it, I mean, I mean to help what we have now is much. So my question to you basically is, we have a lot of, and, and I'm saying it's true, we have a lot of people out there saying, oh, I have an AI tool that is do X, or it's all, all this, you know. How do you, how do you, or what is your, what are your thoughts on, mm -hmm. on something, on, on things like that? I don't want to be, uh, I'll, I'll uh, try to be nice and polite, <laughs> very open. Uh, AI is brilliant idea. But it's really stupid the way how we are coping coping with that. Because I believe this brilliant idea will be powerful and useful only if we find a way that it's so simple and obvious that we are using it and don't discussing it. Why we are not discussing databases or why we are not discussing some uh, Python scripts or methods yeah, exactly. or languages. <laughs> it's it's or why we are not discussing automation in testing anymore. It's like we are discussing, but the question is not whether we often discuss how, but I believe this, this need to be become like standard component in our approach. And then we are there. So my thought about AI is that if this will be just buzzwords in PowerPoints and, and everywhere else, that we are not still there, but once it will become like obvious part of uh, all other frameworks or tools uh, that that will become uh, useful. And I, I believe the idea of chat GPT nowadays or any other algorithms outside the tools, it might be brilliant, but until it's not embedded or integrated and packaged uh, and baked into other tools, we are not there yet. So I uh, believe I then, uh, then, then it'll be uh, super powerful and, and super useful. So we share. Yeah, I mean, it's true. We share. We share that same sentiment, I, and I share that same sentiment with you. Well, I mean, this is. I mean, we could go on and on with this uh, forever and a day. And I think. I think what we need to do is to have a a, a session just about whole the whole AI generative AI thing in, inside this automation, and we kind of run out of time. So. Uh, what we would, uh, what is good to, to say thanks again to Zapotec for, for all this and Marcel, thank you very much for, for, for your session. And I know it, 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 it generated a lot of thoughts in people's head, especially mine. Yeah. I have a whole, I'll show you, I have a whole page of notes, yeah. <laughs> you know, to, 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 to look at. But yeah, thank you very much for this. And, and thanks again to these, the people at Zapotec for giving us this, you know, this opportunity to, to do this. So before before you will be lock off, I give you you have thirty seconds to okay. to wrap up for the audience. Go. Okay. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you for uh, Zapotec and also Larry to you to hosting us. It was brilliant uh, event. Hopefully people enjoyed with with me as I was excited to talk about that. And I really believe, believe this is a. Uh, a uh, big opportunity for all of us to to play with some new tools and searching for even better testing we have and i believe you will enjoy it and wish you all a lot of fun in testing as i said at the beginning 19 years and i still enjoying and exploring that different corners and 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 highways of of ideas so thank you and hopefully see you in some other virtual or physical event. Ah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcel. And the pleasure was, ha was of having you. And with that, I will say thanks again to Zapotec. And I am Larry Goddard, uh, the creator of Classy JS. And I'm a test automation architect at Auto uh, Oxford University Press. And just like Marcel, I have just over 20 years in doing this. And as you see the smile on my face, it's something that we enjoy doing. 
and we enjoy giving back to the community in settings like these. Uh, you know where to reach us. You can reach us on, on LinkedIn. Uh, mostly you can just find us there. And yeah, so thanks yeah. again for everyone for joining. And thank you, Zapotec, for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.